what is this, page 9 by now? Um, electrostatic calculations here. So clown's carrying two balloons. Brush up against this curly rainbow fro. This uh, causes each balloon to acquire a charge of 2 times 10 to the negative 7th coulombs. How large is the electric force between them uh, when they are separated by point there. So um, we, we know that we're dealing with an F equals K, Q1, Q2 over D squared problem or Coulomb's law problem here because we're dealing with two charges. So at first glance, if we just sort of look through this problem, it looks like really we're just given a, a charge and a distance, but after reading it, like we just did, it's each balloon acquires a charge of that, of positive 2 times 10 to the negative 7th. Um, so showing that Q1 and Q2 are both each 2 times 10 to the negative 7th coulombs. So that's what I'm where I'm getting my Q values from, both of those being 2 times 10 to the negative 7th. My 9 times 10 to the 9th, that's the K constant, right? Coming from K, that's part of the formula. We could think of the K as either in front of all this or as part of the numerator, since K over 1 yeah, numerator. 1 times, if we did think of this as K over 1, 1 times D squared would leave it as just simply D squared. So that's why I can get away with. All right, um, my distance is 0.5 meters. So that's part of the uh, squared is part of the formula. So we have to do 0.5 squared there. At this point, just like all the other problems, I would highly recommend doing this top part in your calculator, doing the bottom part in your calculator, two little sub answers, and then dividing the two. Um, if you are going to do everything in one fell swoop, just make sure all of this ends up in parentheses, then you divide, all of this ends up in parentheses as well. All right, um, so you there's two potential answers. They, they are the same answer, but um, in scientific notation, I know it tends to look a little bit different. You'll probably come out with 0.00144 in your calculator, um, unless you are set in scientific notation mode, which most people wouldn't be probably one person is, you know, in, in all four of my classes, but it would come out to be 1.44 times 10 to the neg negative third. A little bit quicker to write it this way, I think, um, but either way um, works. And same deal with some of the other answers in the answer key. I know some people had questions with some of the longer values, like, oh, you had it in scientific notation. I've got it in standard notation. Does it matter? No, it doesn't. It's just, it's just personal preference. Kind of use your judgment when you start getting to really tiny numbers. Um, like this one is kind of borderline. It's like, yeah, it's probably either or. Use your preference. But if you get to something like a really big number, then this one at this point wouldn't make too much sense to write it out in standard notation with a whole bunch of zeros after if this was like 10 to the negative 12. You know, that'd be too small to deal with all the zeros in front. Um, you you just end up making a whole lot of mistakes at that point. So scientific notation is a little bit better at that point. But when it's borderline like this, personal preference. Let's take a look at six. Your little brother peels the wrapping off a new toy. The plastic wrapping develops a charge. 5.7 times 10 to the negative seventh. How many excess electrons? Are on the wrapping all right so we yeah at this point we, we know it's a q equals any type problem or a charge quantization problem because it's asking for how many excess electrons that's a pretty good key phrase for knowing this is the formula that i'm dealing with um, another way that we could look at this is we've only got one charge we're not given anything about distance not given anything about force so if we don't have a distance and a force and we've only got one charge Really, I the only thing I would know for this equation would be k because it stays the same in one of my q's, and then I wouldn't be able to solve for anything else. So that that equation is out of the question as well. So it narrows it down to q equals n e. Well, I know my charge. It develops this charge of 5.7 times 10 to the negative seventh. I know the charge of one electron, and then solve for n. Now at this point, I've still had a ton of students asking, "Oh, do I divide?" 5.7 times 10 to the negative 7th by negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 9th, or do I do it in reverse? Well, that's kind of the wrong, that's the wrong question. So the, the right, the, the better question would be, how do I get n by itself? I don't, I don't care about this side because my variable is not over there. I just constantly in my algebra, constantly have to keep asking myself, how do, myself, how do I get 
this variable by itself, whatever this variable is. In this case, it's variable n. So how do I get n by itself? Well, it's not asking which one do I divide by. It's asking, well, how do, how do I get n by itself? n is currently multiplied by negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. So I've got to do the opposite. Right. And now I have n by itself. Now algebra would tell me whatever I do to this side, I have to do to this side. So in asking myself, or showing how I solve, and then doing it to this side, well, the algebra tells me what I have to do. Now I no longer have to guess, is it you know negative 1.6 divided by 5.7, or is it 5.7 divided by negative 1.6? The algebra tells me it is 5.7 times 10 to the negative 7th divided by negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, and we come out with our excess electrons, which also makes sense, right? Because we, we can't have a negative amount of excess electrons. So in this case, we, we do come out with a negative excess electrons that we have. Well, we've got negative 3.56 times 10 to the 12. How can you have a negative excess? So we just get rid of the, get rid of the um, negative there. The other way to think about this problem is it's telling us that the plastic wrap develops this, this charge of 5.7 times 10 to the negative 7th. Um, the problem probably would have been a little bit better saying develops a negative charge of this or just told us negative right off, the, um, right off the bat and then we would have come out with a positive end value in that case. But just realize that this should be a positive end value no matter how you get that answer. Just realize you can't have negative excess electrons. All right, let's take a look at number 7 end up losing electrons when you slide out of your chair in class. If you touch the light switch, will you get shocked? Yeah, right. So if if you are, you know, sliding out of your chair and then you go to touch a light switch, that's a that's a crappy version of a light switch there. Uh, you just have to trust me on that. If we lose a whole bunch of electrons to the chair and now let's say we've got a we've got a chair and it's got a whole bunch of negatives on it, that means that you are going to be overall positive, right? Slightly positive. Well, just because you're slightly positive doesn't mean that you're still not going to get shocked because realize the the light switch, which we're assuming is a, a decent conductor, so it'll allow it'll allow, allow charge to flow or or to jump, I should say. When I go to touch this light switch, my body is positive overall. Some of these negatives from the lights which are going to want to jump off onto, onto me. And that's for, for every object that has a deficiency of electrons, it's going to gain electrons. Um, if it does not have, if it has too many electrons, an excess of um, electrons, then those electrons are going to jump the other way. But in this case, you're positive um, after, after being charged up, so you need negatives, so it's actually the light switch to you that gets the little the little zap rather than you to the light switch. All right. Um, if you were if you had collected negatives, then it would be the opposite. Remember, it, you're walking to school. Your pants develop a static charge. If you're negatively charged, pants are attracting to your leg. What's happening to the charges in our leg? Ways that you can answer this problem because it's not it's not super specific this could be a, a polarization problem or this could be just a simple positive negative charging by friction but it does say we're walking to school and your pants develop a static charge so meaning they probably didn't have a static charge to begin with so if we think of our pants and we think of our our leg in those pants you got some weird looking legs there, but uh, we think of our legs in those pants. Um, the the pants themselves are going to have both positives and negatives. Same with our leg, both positives and negatives. I'm just going to draw one of them for the, the sake of time here. But I'm going to have some positives there. I'm also going to have some negatives. So both within my, but they're neutral objects to begin with. So once the fabric starts rubbing up and down against your leg, your your leg is either going to lose or gain negatives from the pants or, or vice versa. Remember, it's never the positives, but it says we're developing a 
static charge your negatively charged pants so that means that our pants must be picking up negatives from our leg so in the end we're gonna end up with more negatives in the pants so some of those negatives are gonna jump from the leg to the pants not to say that your leg won't have any negatives in there but now this is negative overall your leg is positive overall because it's lost those negatives pants are negative because they've gained those negatives now we've got an opposite to track sort of scenario going on here pants are negative legs positive we're gonna end up getting that static clean now the other um, way that we could have thought about this is well, what if it was the the pants had some sort of static charge to begin with and they just become even more statically charged that is another possibility and some people did think about this problem that way that would be really similar to the balloon in the wall scenario so to speak now let's say I'm gonna just zoom in on one portion right here and let's say I'm just gonna look at right here um, so here's my here's my pants and then here's the leg right up uh, right up against those pants all right so wall or not the wall sorry the uh, pants like I just said it's very similar to the balloon in the wall uh, scenario the pants are going to have both positive and negative charges and of course our leg is also going to have both positive and negative charges right. now if the if the pants have some sort of negative charge on them to begin with we read the problem as okay they're they're already negatively charged they're just becoming more negatively charged I just mean that I've got an excess of electrons so more more negatives than I do positives if my leg was neutral think about what all these negatives are going to do right, all these negatives are going to want to push the negatives in my leg towards the inside of the leg it's going to leave all these positives exposed and then I'm going to have polarization take place so this portion of the leg would stay more positive this portion of the leg would be more negative after these negatives move over and al although the leg is neutral overall it is polarized so then all the negatives in this leg in, in the uh, pants would end up sticking to the positives um, that are exposed on the leg so two different ways of thinking about that problem just because it's not worded completely clear um, either one of those would be um, su uh, sufficient explanations all right last one here uh, number nine, we've got a hot air balloon. It moves through the sky, develops a charge of you know, that negative 2.5 times 10 to the negative eighth coulombs. What charge has a second hot air balloon developed if they're pushing on each other with a force of 3 times 10 to the negative third newtons from a distance of 5 meters away? Uh, we know our force. We know that we're dealing with two charges. We know that we're dealing with a distance, so... Coulomb's law it is F equals K Q1 Q2 over D squared. Um, again, K can be thought of as in the numerator or in front. Uh, just sort of depends on how your mind operates and what makes more sense to you. Uh, let's go ahead and get rid of that over there. So um, at this point, we know what our K is, right? To begin with, even before looking at the problem, we know what, because uh, it's constant. We know what force is, 3 times 10 to the neg negative 3rd newtons. We know one of the hot air balloons has this charge of 2.5 times 10 to the negative 8th. So that's where this is coming from. Um, what charge does a second hot air balloon have? Then? So that's my Q2. And we know squared is part of the formula. So that's why I have 5 squared, because 5 is my distance. And distance is always squared. So at this point, I would say simplify things down a little bit rather than trying to do this all in one big fell swoop. I would say, if if in doubt, just look for things that you can you can easily take care of. So right here, this is a pretty easy, or I shouldn't say a pretty easy problem, but it's a lot simpler than doing the entire problem. All right, so take your k constant, multiply it by neg get negative 225. So that's a lot nicer than all this stuff, right? Q squared we haven't we haven't touched yet, so we're just going to drag it down there. Five squared uh, we know is 
25, so it may, might make it a little simpler to actually put it in its um, standard form there. We haven't done any, or sorry, with force, F, so we're just dropping that down. So now let's go ahead and deal with it a little bit further. A couple of different ways you could do it. You could look at this as cross multiplication and put this side over 1 and then deal with things like that. Um, this doesn't lend itself as well to cross multiplication as some of the other problems. So I might not do that for this one. But it is one way that you could. So at this point, I would say probably the best thing to do, let's get rid of the denominator here. Let's multiply both sides by 25 so I can get rid of 25. So it cancels. Well, if I do it to one side, I've got to do it to the other. So then at this point, I'd say go ahead and solve this out. That's where I'm getting this point 0.075 from. We've cleared up the 25 here, so now we end up with 0 0.075 equals negative 225q. Now this is nice because this is a, a fairly simple algebra problem. All the rest of this isn't, it's not entirely complex, but it's not exactly the simplest problem either. Now we've simplified it down to a point where this is, this is much easier to manage. So now, again, don't think of this as do I divide 0 0.075 by negative 225 or do I divide negative 225 by 0 0.075? Always go back to asking yourself that question. Really, how do I get Q by getting rid of negative 225 on this side? If I did it to this side, I also have to do it to my other side as well. So it becomes 0 0.075 divided by negative 225. And that is going to give me a very small number because, I mean, this number isn't even anywhere near 1. And I'm dividing it by, you know, negative 225 times. So it's going to be a very small number, which is fine. Because my other charge is a pretty small number, too. So we would expect that this is a 3, 3 times 10 to the negative 4th. Um, and we do know that um, these balloons are pushing on each other. So they're repelling each other. My force is positive, which means it's a force of repulsion. And now my math supports that. My final answer is negative. I have two negative charges then. So if I've got a negative charge and a negative charge, that means it's a force of repulsion or a force of pushing. So I know that I'm in pretty good shape there. Conceptually, that matches with my math. All right, till next time.